Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chapter 37 of House of the Scorpion. Yes, I know, it's very overdue. But now that I finally have some time, I'm going to finish up this book, the last two chapters. So without further ado, Chapter 37, Homecoming. Matt reveled in the clean white sheets, soft pillows, and the flower-scented air drifting in from the garden. Sister Inez had ordered him to bed after looking at the sores on his body. Fidelidio and Tauntaun were housed at a boarding school run by the Covenant and their convent, but they were visited by Matt and Chacho every day. Poor Chacho, thought Matt. He barely noticed when anyone visited him. He drifted in and out of dreams, sometimes calling for his father and sometimes raving about bats. Sister Inez said, said his mind needed time to recover from his terrible ordeal. He had breathed far less than was good for him under the heavy whale bones. His body had been starved of oxygen, and the pressure had cracked several of his ribs. The best part of the day for Matt was when Maria visited. He was content to listen, while she never ran out of things to say. She talked about stray cats that she had rescued, or how she made a mistake and put, cake and put salt into cake batter instead of sugar. Maria's life was full of drama. A flower opening in the garden and a butterfly lighting on a window were causes for excitement. Through her eyes, Matt saw the world as an indefinite, infinitely hopeful place. Now Matt watched the door eagerly, be eagerly because he had heard Maria's voice in the hall, but he was disappointed to see both her and her mother. Esperanza was dressed in a steel gray. She reminded Matt of the, one of the guided misses El Patron used to get for his birthday. I brought you some guavas, said Maria, placing a basket on his bedside table. Sister Inez says they're full, says they're full of vitamin C. She says you need them to clear up your skin condition. Matt winced. He knew his acne was horrible. Sister Inez said it was caused by pollution in the water the keepers used to grow plankton. You look, he you look healthy, said Esperanza. Thank you, said Matt. He didn't trust her. Healthy enough to get up. Oh, mother, he leads, needs at least another week in bed, said Maria. You will not turn this young man into one of your invalids, Esperanza told her daughter. I've had quite enough of three-legged cats and fish that float upside down. Matt is young and resilient. He has a very important job to do. Uh-oh, Matt thought. What is Esperanza up to now? We are terribly worried, Maria admitted. We're more than worried, Esperanza said in a relentless way. Something has gone wrong in opium. Not that every, not that anything was ever right in that godforsaken wasteland, but El Patron at least had his ties with the outside world. No one has heard a word from there since the day he died. Amelia is still in opium, Maria explained, and so is Dada. I'm still angry at them for how they treated you, but I don't want anything, anything bad to happen to them. Her eyes were filled with tears. Esperanza made an exasperated sound. It wouldn't bother me a bit if something happened to your dada. Oh, do stop brimming over like a fountain, Maria. It's a silly habit and it clouds your wits. Your father is an evil man. I can't help it, Maria sniffled. Matt handed her one of his tissues. He privately agreed with Esperanza, but his heart was on Maria's side. Opium is in a state of lockdown, said Esperanza. I can think of only three times that's happened in the past hundred years. It means that nothing is allowed to enter or leave the country. Can we just wait until they decide to contact us, said Matt. The other lockdowns lasted a few hours. This one's gone on for three months. Matt realized what this meant. Shipments of opium had to go out every day to keep money moving around the empire. Dealers in Africa, Asia, and Europe must be clamoring for their supplies. McGregor and the other farmers couldn't cover the shortfall. They put most of their land to crops that produced cocaine and hashish. What am I supposed to do about it, Matt said. Esperanza, Esperanza smiled, and he knew he'd walked into a trap. All incoming hovercrafts have to be cleared by the security system. The pilot placed his hand on an identity plate in the cockpit. His fingerprints and DNA signature beamed to the ground. If these are cleared, the ship is allowed to land. If not, it's blown out of the sky, said Maria. Mother, this plan is awful. During a lockdown, Esperanza went on ignoring her daughter. No ships are cleared, with one exception. El Patron's signature overrides everything. Matt understood at once. 
His fingerprints and DNA were the same as El Patron's. How do you know the system hasn't been changed? I don't, said Esperanza. I'm counting on the Alocrans to have forgotten about the override. They must be in some kind of trouble or they would have sealed themselves they wouldn't have sealed themselves off. What kind of trouble, Matt thought? Could the Egypts have revolted, or could the Farm Patrol have taken over? Perhaps Mr. Alocran was locked in a power struggle with Steven and Benito. The way I see it, he said, I'll get blown out of the sky. If I do manage to survive, the Alocrans will have me put to sleep like an old dog. I'm a clone, in case you've forgotten. I'm livestock. Maria flinched. Matt didn't care. Let her understand what they were asking of him. He didn't care whether Amelia or her dad I were safe, but then he heard Maria choke back a sob. Oh, very well, he said angrily. I'm no good for spare parts anymore. You might as well throw me away on this. I don't want to throw you away, Maria said, weeping. Let's all take a deep breath and start over, said Esperanza. First of all, Matt, you aren't a clone. Matt was so startled, he sat straight up in bed. Oh, you were a clone. There's no mistake about that. But we're talking about international law now. Esperanza started pacing around the room as though she were lecturing a class. International law is my specialty. In the first place, clones shouldn't exist. That lot of good that does me, said Matt. But if they do exist, they're livestock, as you say. That makes it possible for them to be slaughtered like chickens or cattle. Maria moaned and put her head down on the bed. You can't have two versions of the same person at the same time, Esperanza went on. One of them, the copy, has to be clear to be declared an unperson. But when the original dies, the copy takes his place. What does that mean, Matt said. It means you really are El Patron. You have his body and his identity. You own everything he owned and rule everything he ruled. It means you're the new master of opium. Maria raised her head. Matt's human? He always was, her mother replied. The law is a wicked fiction to make it possible to use clones for transplants. But bad law or not, we're not we're going to use it now. If you survive the landing, Matt, I'll do everything in my power to make you the new reigning drug lord. I have the backing of the Adstalon and US governments on this. On the Umus promise that once you're in control you destroy the opium empire and tear down the barrier that has kept Adstalon and the United States apart for so long. Matt stared at the small, fierce woman as he tried to understand the sudden shift in his fortunes. He guessed that Esperanza could care less about her daughters than her desire to destroy opium. She had gone off without a backward glance when Maria was only five. In all the years since, she'd never contradicted her. She never contacted her. It was only when Maria made the first move that Esperanza returned and proceeded to order everyone around. Matt thought she, she would easily sacrifice him to realize her goal. But now he, now how he could refuse this terrible suffering El Patron had caused. He understood the full extent of it now. It wasn't the only drug addicts throughout the world or the illegals doomed to slavery. It was their orphan children as well. You could even say the old, old man was responsible for the keepers. If Matt had become El Patron, then he'd gotten the whole package. Wealth, power, and the evil that created it. I promise, he said. The hovercraft trembled as it was scanned by beacons from the ground. Matt glanced at the pilot. The man's face was grim. When the red light goes on, press your right hand on the identity plate. He said, Warning, ground artillery destroy. Warning, ground artillery deployed, flashed a panel over the controls. They'll shoot first and ask questions later, thought Matt. He carried messages from the from Estlin and the US presidents, but they wouldn't do much if he got blown out of the sky. There's the signal, cried the pilot. The identity plate lit up. Matt slammed his hand down. He felt the tingling he'd noticed when he pressed the glowing scorpion outside the secret passage in the mansion. The red light faded and the panel turned to welcoming green. You did it, sir. Well done. The pilot began to bleed the pilot began to bleed off anti gravity in preparation for landing. Matt felt a glow of happiness. The man had called him Sir. Matt watched anxiously through the window. He saw the uh, the Estancia as he'd never seen it before. The water purification plant lay so far to the east, and the little church Celia visited. Could she visit? Could she still visit in Egypt? Was it to the west? Was to the west. 
In between were storage storehouses, drug purification labs, and a factory where food pellets for the Egypts were made. Slightly to the north was the gray featureless hospital. Even from here it looked sinister. Next to it was the mausoleum where the alacrans kept, their mar kept in their marble drawers. The swimming pool flashed with sunlight as they passed over. Matt searched the grounds for people. He saw Idgits crouching by a lawn. He saw maids hanging out wash and someone seemed to be repairing a roof. No one looked up. No one showed the slightest interest in the hovercraft that was now descending to the ground. Where's the welcoming committee? He murmured. A platoon of bodyguards always ran to greet visitors. The ship bumped gently to a landing. Do you need a weapon, sir? asked the pilot, handing him a gun. Mac looked at him with dismay. Such guns had been used by the farm patrol to stun and kill the parents of Chacho, Flacco, Tantan, and the other orphans. It'd probably be better to appear friendlier, he said, handing the weapon back. I'll remain here in lift-off lift mode in case you want to leave quickly, the pilot said. Matt opened the door and climbed down. The landing field was empty. Only s the, on the only sounds were of birds, fountains, and briefly the hammer of a man fixing the roof. Matt followed a winding path through the gardens. His job was to confront the alacrans and end the lockdown. He could disable the lockdown system and sub himself when he found it. Tamlin or Daft Donald would know its location. Then Esperanza and the top officials from both countries on the border would descend on opium and try to install Matt as leader. I had better odds for survival in the boneyard, he thought. He saw a peacock shirt across the lawn. A mob of red-winged blackbirds shrieked at one another from a crowded tree. A winged baby watched him from the top of a fountain. Matt's nerves were raw. Any minute now, Mr. Alacran would stride out of the house and shout, Take this creature away. Dispose of it at once. Memories threatened to overwhelm him. He didn't know what, know what he'd do if he saw Celia. Matt went up the broad steps leading to the salon. It was there that El Patron had introduced him to the, f to the family so long ago. It was there that El Viejo had lain like a starved bird in his coffin, and Amelia, surrounded by her Egypt flowered girls, had married Stephen. It was though the great hall thronged with ghosts. They hovered behind the white marble pillars. They breathed over the dark pond covered with water lilies. Matt saw an ancient fish rise from the depths to look at him with a round yellow eye. Matt froze. Someone was playing a piano. The person was certainly skilled, but he, or she, was attacking the music with such ferocity that it bordered on madness. Matt raced towards the sound. The noise rolled like a tidal wave out of the music room, and he had to cover his ears. Stop, he yelled, but the person didn't react. Matt crossed the room and grabbed the man's arm. Man's arm. Mr. Ortega spun around. He took one look and fled. Matt heard his footsteps disappear down the hall. I wasn't that bad of a student, Matt murmured. But of course, Mr. Ortega had thought he was dead. He was probably crying alarm from one end of the house to the other. Now it was only a matter of time before someone showed up. Matt sat down. His hands were calloused from the work he'd done at the salt factory, and he was afraid the hard labor had made his fingers clumsy. But as he began the, uh, Adigio from Beto the Adigio from Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 5, the awkwardness fell away. The music swelled through his body, transporting him from the horrors of the past few months. He felt as light as a hawk con coasting in the upper air of the oasis. He played until he felt a hand on his shoulder. Matt turned. Still in a daze of music, he saw Celia dressed in the fla Celia dressed in the flowered dress he remembered so well. Mijo! she cried, gathering him into a ferocious bear hug. Oh my darling, you're so thin. What happened to you all this time? How did you get back? What's wrong with your face? It's so thin and covered with zits, said Matt, struggling to catch his breath. Oh, well, it's all part of growing up, declared Sila. They'll go away with the right food. She held him at arm's length to look at him. I'm sure you're taller. Are you okay? said Matt. Her sudden appearance shocked him. He was afraid of bursting into tears. Of course, but you took about five years off Mr. Ortega's life. How did you... I mean, Tamlin said you had to hide. Matt couldn't trust his voice to say anymore. Tamlin, oh my, 
Sue suddenly looked very tired. We've been in lockdown for months and couldn't send out a message. Why didn't Mr. Eloquin or Stephen do something, said Matt. You'd better come with me. Sue led Matt through the halls, and once again he was struck to how silent everything was. They came to the kitchen, and at last Matt saw something reassuringly normal. Two undercooks were kneading bread in a made with slicing vegetables. Strings of garlic and chilies hung from the ceiling. The odor of roast chicken wafted over him from the big wood fire oven. Mr. Ortega and Daft Donald were sitting at a table with cups of coffee and two laptop computers. See, I wasn't making it up, Mr. Ortega, said Mr. Ortega. Daft Donald typed something on, to, on the computer. I was not running around like Chicken Little, he said, Mr. Ortega reading the screen. You'd be upset too if a ghost grabbed your shoulder. Daft Donald smiled. Matt stared at them. He never thought the two men outside their duties as music teacher and bodyguard. He never tried to communicate with them, and besides, he always assumed Daft Donald wasn't bright. It better begin. I'd better begin, sighed Celia. She settled down between Matt and the two men and fetched him a mug of hot cocoa. The odor brought back memories so, fr so profound the room wavered before his eyes. For an instant, Matt was in the little house in the poppy fields. A storm raged outside, but in the house it was warm and safe. Then the scene faded, and he was back in the kitchen. You remember what I said about El Patron never letting anything go? Celia began. Matt nodded. Tamlin used to say that things, and people, became part of El Patron's dragon horde. Used to say? Matt thought with a chill. What did that mean? That's why he wouldn't let Felicia run away and why he kept Tom so close to him, although he hated the boy. We all belonged to him. The Alacrans, the bodyguards, the doctors, me, Tam Lin, and you. Most of all, you. End of chapter 37. <laughs> well, I just looked up at my computer, I got another subscriber notification. Soon I'm going to be doing a 100 subscriber special. Anyway, with only one chapter remaining, this has been an awesome journey with you guys, but I will see you all next time.